very, very warm welcome um, to the room. My name is Liam McCarthy. I'm one of the deputy presiding officers at the Scottish Parliament, and it's a real pleasure um, to be uh, kicking off this joint Scottish Parliament and Globe International event. Uh, I think as a result of um, changes uh, in the schedule out in Dubai with the closing ceremony coming forward um, a, a little earlier than was anticipated, unfortunately, we don't have quite as much time as we thought. So I'm going to keep my scene setting preamble um, to the absolute bare minimum um, and, and just kick over to uh, Malini uh, Mera, Chief Executive of Global International, to introduce uh, our, our speakers uh, at the Dubai end and uh, I'll come back um, and, and introduce Sarah um, uh, slightly later on to keep the contribution. So over to you, uh, Malini. Thank you so much, um, and it's uh, it's a pleasure to be joining you once again. Thank you for your patience. Um, the um, this is quite experimental, of course. We're delighted that we're setting a new precedent with this live feed directly from the parliamentary pavilion from COP28 into the Scottish Parliament, and we hope that this this sets the precedent for new best practice, um, so that those who are actually physically still in parliaments can uh, can benefit from direct inter interaction with what's going on here. So I'm delighted to be joined by two honorable members of parliament who have also been here for a considerable length of time this is day day 12 um, everything closes down here tomorrow um, but uh, to my to my right is the honorable Cedric Froelich from the Parliament of South Africa where he is the chair of the committees on oversight and ICT and at the end we have uh, we're joined by Senator um, Merlin um, Abello Alfonso, who is uh, from the Congress of Micronesia, where she is the chair of the Committee on Climate Change and Environment. Um, we have one very seasoned commentator, and in Senator Abello Alfonso, we have somebody who is new to the COP process, and we thought that it would be very interesting to have perspectives from both of them. Um, I would be happy just to share a few words in terms of setting the scene from our side. Um, and then I will be handing over to Honorable Cedric Froelich um, and in turn to um, Senator Abello Alfonso. Um, so here at COP, it's, the atmosphere is very different now. We are into uh, literally the last hours. We have just received notification um, a couple of hours ago that the closing ceremony itself is taking place. It's around quarter to five now. The closing ceremony would have started already 15 minutes ago. It concludes at six o'clock. Um, and that gives you an idea of the, the, the pace, the very sheer pace that the COP presidency has applied to this. Um, as I shared with you last time, the COP president has a very business-like determined approach to the COP. He had managed to gavel through a very contentious item, the agenda, which normally can take up to two days at COPs. He managed to gavel it through in the first hour. And he has been determined to conclude the conference, to conclude COP, by 11 a.m. tomorrow, which is unheard of. Um, but I think they want to, the Emirati presidency wants to set a new approach, a new model for these COPs. So let's see if he's successful. Um, in terms of what we're discussing here, all eyes now are focused on the texts. So you have the global stock take text, which came out a couple of days ago. Um, it has some contentious um, elements missing. Um, of course, as you would all know, there are key issues around uh, key controversies around the language of phase out of phase down of fossil fuels, whether fossil fuels are going to be abated or not. So we have seen considerable lobbying by different groups of countries. Today, there was a coalition of 16 countries, including France, Canada, Fiji and others uh, who were calling unequivocally for language in this text to phase out fossil fuels. So that really is the number one contentious item on the presidency's, um, uh, presidency's agenda. And this is what they're going to be focused on in the closing hours. So um, I think in terms of the highlights over the last uh, 10 days or so, what we've seen is um, a COP of two halves, really. There's the negotiation COP, um, which is in its own bubble. So that really is where um, government delegates, officials, international organization, organizations have been focusing. But there's the other COP. And the other COP is the kinds of the trade fair, the festival, the circus COP, in which a huge amount of activity has been taking place. And many of us have certainly met our steps quotient for every day um, and walked m you know, possibly hundreds of kilometers over over the course of the last 12 months. So what's that resulted in? Well, it has resulted in new pledges and new declarations. So we have something like, um, I think, 42 pledges 
32 declarations covering a range of issues, everything from food and health uh, to culture, methane, forests, etc. And commentators have likened this COP to be similar to Glasgow in the sense that it's focused very much on partnerships for implementation. But what we want to avoid is what happened at Glasgow, which was that there was, Glasgow was very declarative. There were many, many declarations and commitments not legally binding to undertake um, action together. And yet they haven't been accompanied by clear, transparent monitoring mechanisms to ensure that they have delivered. So that's the fate that we want to avoid with this new round of declarations, pledges, commitments that have been made at this COP. So I will, I will um, close now and I will hand over to um, the Honorable Cedric Froelich for his assessment of where things are. No, thank you very much, Malini, and also good afternoon to all the Honorable Members present and those on the online platform. Now, indeed, your summary as to where we are is absolutely correct. Um, we've had the um, opportunity to interact with members of parliament from different countries on a bilateral and individual basis, and most recently this afternoon with the EU delegation of members who are here. And there is this push, a greater need for urgency. The uh, last assessment report, the sixth report, paints a very bleak picture in terms of where we are, and we are, as the title of this event says, in code red. It's an urgency, the climate crisis is escalating, and what will be interesting is to see how this will translate into the outcome text that is here. We see in the presence and the footprint of participants from the fossil fuel industry participating excessively here, and I'm of course, networking, but it also brings home the reality of what is being discussed. The fossil fuel industry is part and parcel of the solution that should be there. And whether it is phasing down or phasing out, the language needs to be unambiguous. We need to have greater adaptation urgency. We need to see more action. We need to have clear reporting mechanisms. We need greater transparency to ensure that we do not evolve from one COP to another were the same issues, just a different language emanating from it. South Africa, of course, will be directly uh, affected by the wording of the outcome document that is there. And in our case, we are very clear. The cabinet has re um, recently, a few days ago, agreed to the new integrated resource plan that has a differentiated approach in terms of our reliance on um, a, a coal as the primary source of energy generation in the country and power supply. And that track sets new time frames that is there. There is a time frame that says in a very ambitious period, this is what can be achieved. But if that is not achievable, this is the other track that can be followed. And I hope that our representatives who is part of the final outcome discussions and negotiations ensure that the text captures that. If you have a situation where there is over ambition on the one side and under ambition on the other side, we well may set ourselves up for a very nasty trade uh, regime in the world where you'll have a one trade system that relies on fossil fuel and another one that is scaling down significantly. And that can set us up for unintended consequences. But it will require from all the countries, all the negotiators and the push from the politicians especially, from the ministers, that we do have more ambition towards adaptation and also greater and more transparent reporting mechanisms. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to hand over the mic now to Senator Abelo Alfonso for her views. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my fellow parliamentarians in Scotland. And Distinguished parliamentarian, <laughs> my partner here next to me, and panelists, and everybody, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here, and um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to speak uh, in today's uh, event. Um, I was informed that um, the talk would be about ex my experience, and I guess uh, it has been mentioned that it is my first COP experience. 
In addition to that, I would like to say that it is also my first experience being a parliamentarian. Barely seven months into my role as a parliamentarian, I've spent uh, my the focus uh, on past years, more than 25 years as a physician and a health practitioner, and at the same time slash owner of a secondary hospital back home, the only private hospital back home. So my background has totally been focused on health, not even realizing the impacts of climate change. And this has been an eye opener and a huge learning experience for me. So from the perspectives of parliamentarian, um, I would say that uh, I came to COP, you know, with an open mind and uh, trying to figure out what it's all about. And frankly speaking, the first time I heard COP was when I first entered the political <laughs> arena. I mean, everybody was talking about COP, COP28. I had to go and Google it up. <laughs> That's how, how far, uh, far uh, removed I was when it came to climate change. And uh, never in my mind did I really connect and interlink the huge impact climate change had on the health of the people. So this was a really new experience for me coming in, and I think uh, based on the past uh, weeks, uh, my tunnel vision has expanded, and it has brought me even more to, uh, to a greater realization of how climate change has impact on every aspect of our lives. Coming in, uh, you know, it has been a really huge eye-opener to interact to engage with fellow parliamentarians, with um, fellow islanders from the SIDS nations, to be able to learn, absorb. Uh, if you would ask me how I would uh, sum up my experience here at COP as a first time participant and also as a parliamentarian, I would have four words that comes instantly to mind. And that's overwhelming. Uh, number two would be uh, very um, educational, transformative, and empowering. And um, I would like to share that in our own nation, being chairman or uh, being chairperson of the Special Committee on uh, Climate Change and Environment, our committee, this committee that I'm chairperson of, is actually as labeled as a special committee meaning it is not a permanent committee. And this is something that I've come to realize that probably needs to change and needs to be worked on when we get back home. I mean, my, my, my uh, parliamentarian colleagues all agree after our experience here in COP uh, that this is really crucial and important for our nation to put it in the forefront and make this a permanent committee to be able to address the impacts of climate change back home and how we fit into the role of trying to move our nation forward. Our participation at this COP has been mostly at the parliamentary level, so the technical aspects of it have been dealt with more in the executive uh, uh, members of our delegation that have been here. Nevertheless, we do feel equally um, you know, concerned about the issues that have been raised and the sensitivity of some areas that major have major impacts on the SIDS nations. So being here is a privilege and an honor, and we're very thankful to be part of this. And as I said, it's a huge learning experience. And one can't come to COP and return back home and not feel like a changed person. And I think that's one thing that I can absolutely confirm that for me, going back, I'm a totally different uh, person with a wider perspectives on how the impact of climate change has been affecting everybody worldwide, but most especially our small island nations. So thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you so much for sharing that. This truly, I think for many people, this is a life-changing experience. Um, Chair, back to you, please. Thanks very much, uh, Malini. I'm, I'm conscious that the audio has not been brilliant all the way through, so some colleagues may have not picked up everything, although certainly the latter stages there 
um, it was it, it was very very clear. Um, look, I'm going to um, introduce first uh, Sarah Boyack. Um, I think Philip Dunn is in the process of joining us, so hopefully we'll be able to hear from him as well. Um, but Sarah, who was first elected to the Scottish Parliament in uh, 1999, served as a minister, um, and I think has built up a very strong track record uh, on the broad sweep of environmental policy, um, pretty much from the, the get go. So I, I think, Sarah, uh, your observations on how we as parliamentarians and, and legislatures can be um, playing our part, both in holding government to account, but in terms of ensuring that we fulfil um, our, our ambitions and, 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 and um, statutory requirements in relation to meeting our, our uh, climate ambitions. Sarah. Thanks very much, Liam. Um, it's absolutely great to join everyone today. Um, and looking at how we um, make sure that Parliament's put sustainable development is absolutely discussed whenever we're doing any scrutiny work. And I was really given three questions to answer today. Firstly, how are our committees working together? Secondly, have our budget processes changed, how we're spending the money? And third, are there any changes in which the way our bills are actually scrutinised to make sure that they are actually delivering? So I'm going to answer those, th or try and answer those three questions. Um, firstly, our committees are working together um, and are much more focused. Um, and I think having COP26 being held in Scotland really raised the profile of the work in sustainable development and the importance of parliamentary scrutiny of what the government's doing. So in June last year, the conveners group, which is all the chairs of our committees in the parliament, agreed a package of proposals that was going to strengthen our scrutiny right across uh, the Parliament on climate change. And we focused on that, and it's now key strategic priorities for this Parliament session. So reports to our conveners group a year after we agreed that this needed to be done showed that nearly all our committees are now actually applying a climate lens to areas of scrutiny. And that's really important. So we're getting annual updates from our conveners group from the UK Climate Change Committee. Um, we're looking at the research um, so that we can be sure that our subject committees are asking the right questions. We're liaising with the Scottish Government to make sure that we've got the emissions data by each committee portfolio so that everybody has the right information. And we're trying to think about how we strengthen how we work as a parliament. Um, and I think that's really important in terms of making sure that we're always focused on it. And, and lastly, and importantly, we're trying to make sure that our MSPs, our elected representatives and their staff and the parliamentary staff all have the right kind of training. So we're doing capacity building so that we know how we can maximise our impact. Um, and I think that's... It's really important the work that our Net Zero Committee is doing at the moment, um, because what they tried to do was to open up discussion beyond the Parliament itself. So they've recently launched a people's panel to undertake legislative scrutiny once we've passed legislation and to see how it's actually working on our 2009 Climate Change Act which I think is really important. And that's involving people from our communities and society to be involved in that deliberative democracy and um, to make sure our climate scrutiny is working. Um, we've also changed how our budget processes work since COP26. So we've tried to keep working with the government in Scotland and stakeholders to try and look at the budget and review it in terms of relation to climate change. How does it actually impact on climate change? And we used work that was done by the Fraser Valander Institute in Scotland that finished this time last year. And it said there were three things that really needed to be done to improve our processes and transparency. So starting in the budget um, that's happening this year, um, which hopefully we'll be getting next week, there's going to be a dedicated climate narrative se section in the budget documentation. And the, the Institute suggested that we should do that, the government should do that, so that it gives you a comparative impact across the budget, which will let us look at how we actually implement our climate change targets that have got statutory weight that were passed by Parliament. And then the next year, for 24-25, to think about looking at all the all the spending lines across our budget and actually say what the climate impact would be of that expenditure. And then thirdly, to actually have a Scottish government-wide 
net zero assessment, they would actually formally look at a dedicated carbon assessment process at the early stage of policy development, so that when you get to the detail and the final implementation, that's got a proper carbon assessment. So um, quite exciting in that level, because we're now getting, um, we're seeing the process of that and implementing those recommendations beginning to happen. Um, and it does feel like a now issue because the Parliament will get the budget next week and in the new year, our committee will start scrutinising that budget in relation to climate and sustainable development priorities. So that's about the importance of climate change and sustainable development. Then we've got the budget. The other thing I was asked to mention was about how we're changing the way bills are scrutinised. Um, and I think it's really important. We've now got what we call the Sustainable De Impact Development Tool. Um, and it's basically trying to make sure that every time we pass a piece of legislation, it's thinking about how we develop fair and just societies that will thrive in the long term. And there's going to be two essential conditions for every piece of legislation we've passed. Firstly, we cannot damage our environmental systems that make human and all other life possible and bearable. And secondly, that our economic, our political and our cultural systems can't favour some people while harming others. Um, and that's on the basis of the UK's shared framework for sustainable development. So we're trying to trying to make sure that's happening in all our legislation um, and it's going to need sound evidence, governance systems that are open, democratic and involve our communities. Um, and I think the key principles that we'll have to look at in every piece of legislation, living within environmental limits, ensuring a strong, healthy and just society, achieving a sustainable economy, promoting good governance and using sign, sound signs responsibly. So I think that's very exciting. Our committees are starting work on this. Um, we're also, as a parliament, trying to do as much as we can to tackle the climate and biodiversity crisis. We've got two climate acts we passed in 2009 and 2019. And then in 2021, we passed a motion saying we needed to tackle the nature crisis too. So we're trying to get a joined up approach um, and also link in with the cost of living crisis we've got here. We've now got a just transition commission set up by the government um, five years ago now to bring together stakeholders and trade unions so that we get the eco economic change. And um, our presiding officer knows this, we've got a raft of cross party groups where we all work together, not in the chamber, but in a very collaborative and constructive way to look at how we need to do more together and bring um, other organisations in to work with us as a parliament. Um, and just the last couple of things I'd mentioned before my time runs out, we've also got a, a link with our cross, our a Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, where we work with other members in our British, Irish, Mediterranean region. So we've discussed our sustainable impact development tool. We've looked at all sorts of renewables that we can promote because lots of us are island countries with lots of seashore and we've looked at blue carbon issues. Um, and I'll finish on this point. Last week it was quite exciting because I got permission to introduce in Parliament a wellbeing and sustainable development piece of legislation as a member to establish a future generations commissioner. And at the same time, the Scottish Government uh, announced that they would consult on producing their own legislation on the issue. So it's been exciting times in the Parliament. I think a lot's happened in the last couple of years. Um, the challenge for us all is actually implementation. Every bit of legislation and our budgets have to contribute to tackling climate change, not just in Scotland, but making that positive contribution globally. Um, I'll stop there now, um, Liam. It's been a real privilege to speak to you and listen to colleagues today. Thank you. Thanks very much, um, Sarah. It's a bit of a whistle stop to you here. I'm delighted that um, Philip Dunn has been able to um, join us. Um, first elected in 2005, like Sarah, um, uh, has served in ministerial office. But uh, for the purposes of today's um, uh, meeting, I, more relevantly, is currently the chair of the House of Commons Environmental Audit Committee. Um, he's joining us, I think, from a train station, so hopefully the audio and the visuals oh. will hold out. Um, but Philip, over to over to you for your thoughts. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Liam. I hope you can hear me. I am, as you just said, uh, sitting in a train station, so we may be disrupted by some announcements, and I'm trying to get my video going, but it doesn't seem to want to work, so 
hope you can hear me. Can you just put a thumbs up to indicate you can hear? Um, I can't actually see you now either. Um, so, hearing you loud and clear, Philip. Crack excellent. On. Well, if we're being broadcast into the Globe Pavilion uh, within COP28, I, I hope Malini is there. I'd just like to thank her and her team for allowing our select committee to have a platform um, last week at, in Dubai to be able to launch one of our reports, which is a uh, was a world first for our committee anyway. A uh, great opportunity to be able to talk to other parliamentarians about some of the work being done uh, in the UK Parliament. So in response to uh, the topics to be discussed today, I think that the message I'd like to get across to those who are participating is that we as backbench parliamentarians have an absolutely crucial role to play in holding our respective governments to account to help them to stay on the right path to meeting their commitments made at COP uh, this year and previous years, um, and in general to delivering uh, on the climate change agen agenda for adaptation and mitigation. And that without us, uh, many countries would rely solely on their media, and in many countries they are often uh, mouthpieces of the government. So parliaments are really vital components in um, helping the public hold their governments uh, to account, as we all know. Um, in the UK, I do hope you can hear this. I'll try and hold it a bit closer to my phone. Um, in the UK, the uh, Environmental Audit Committee has a role across government. Uh, and we can reach not into the devolved administrations. We've just heard from Sarah about what's happening within the Scottish um, Parliament, uh, but we can reach into local authorities and into the private sector to ensure that uh, initiatives that are being uh, set through regulation for private companies operating within our uh, territories also meet their own requirements uh, for, uh, for in, in adapting to climate change in the way they conduct their business. What, what we we do in terms of the support that we receive from Parliament in undertaking this work is uh, that we have the benefit of, in the UK of a climate change committee which was established um, by the UK when the legislation was passed to achieve net zero Britain uh, for 2050 back in 2008. And this is a uh, professionally uh, staffed group of experts who advise both government and parliament. Their remit is to advise parliament on progress uh, towards achieving the net zero ambition. And they do this through five yearly carbon budgets, uh, which align with uh, the UN processes, uh, so that we have this informed group of experts who each year provide a report to parliament and to the government on, uh, on the UK's progress, and we have the opportunity to scrutinise that committee and uh, challenge them on uh, their findings, and then directly challenge the government um, in response. And ahead of COP28, we had a presentation from uh, the Chief Executive of the Climate Change Committee on how the UK was shaping up for the contributions that they um, hope to make in uh, the COP that is coming to an end tomorrow. Uh, and we also had the Minister for the Environment for the UK, Graham Stewart, who's been leading our delegation in Dubai, um, before, here before our committee to present uh, to the extent that he was able, given the status of negotiations at that time, so he was somewhat circumscribed, what the UK's ambitions were for COP28 and the areas where he hoped to see real progress and further commitments from the UK. So this is a very direct um, example of where parliamentarians are able to um, to challenge government ministers and officials to with, with the, both the extent of their ambition and their delivery against those ambitions. And we have, uh, in answer to, to one of the questions that Sarah was asked, as was I, about support, uh, in addition to the third party independent body which the climate change committee is we also have a resource within parliament that we can call upon um, not just the house of commons library 
but um, we have a, a, a an individual who's a uh, an academic who supports the work of our committee and other committees in uh, making sure that we've got access to the latest data available from uh, whichever source it happens to come from. So I feel that as a parliamentary committee, we are very well supported by our clerks and um, their uh, and their professional advisors to be able to uh, to really de delve into some of the detail through our reporting structures. Um, we undertake inquiries uh, uh, continuously. We have sort of three or four on the go at any one time, to different aspects of environmental policy, all of which ultimately sort of sits within the ambition to achieve uh, the, the COP process targets, uh, which we're all uh, engaged in. And I feel that this is a system that is working well and uh, we are uh, you know, able to, to share best practice with colleagues from around the world and how this, this system of backbench select committees works in this field. Liam, my train is just arriving. So I may just pause and I can come back and get involved in questions when I'm sitting down, if I may. That's fine, Philip. Um, you, you missed the preamble which um, I, I, that I gave earlier, which was that um, we're going to have to cut this short because our colleagues in Dubai are going to have to rush off for uh, an earlier than expected uh, closing um, ceremony. So by the time you get settled on your train, we may no longer be here, but please do feel free to come back um, and uh, it'd be lovely to have you. So thank you very much for your remarks. Um, could I just, in the very limited time that's available, invite uh, maybe Cedric and, and Merlin to offer some observations, um, given that you are in, 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 in the very eye of things in Dubai there, about what you would take as the priorities for your respective parliaments coming away from the discussions you've been involved in in Dubai. Maybe, Cedric, if you were to take that first. No, thank you very much. I'll be very brief. The one thing is, is that the IPC C6 report clearly state the importance of parliamentarians in terms of climate policy as well as biodiversity policy. And it's no longer an issue whether parliamentarians should be here or not. It has become part of the process and also thank you to GLOBE for having the first ever pavilion uh, at a COP conference. Close. Thank you.